Ketil. Ketil Davids got machine at Queen's Nebar to it, Mogesal, maybe to most all expert of Sukraini Dan, Pitayo expert the Ukraina, as a Mogesal, maybe to expert of Moldovidan, Satu expert the Republic of Moldova, Mogesal, maybe Sakatulos expert of Sakatulos, Adokata Associates, Europe's Metsnirunt Rebidan, a much old Umrep student, Epsa Suliat, Actams Resazogado Evas. Um, the other thing is that the association of 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 the Ubrebo expert ebi Ukraine dan Moldo dan da Sakatolo dan Ghani khila ben mokal kete individual ur sakme ebze ius imshele ben adam esuple ot Europol sasamartos ni er mirebu an Ghani khil ius pota shiar sebu gadat squat ila bebze Rusetis Federatsiis ina abdek zalen nishnelo ani gadat squat ila baiko rigit me ur gadat squat ila ba chuen adam esuple bata komit et is parklebshi romeli Sakatolo sadu Function reps, Gandhi Hillet, Irveli Unizia, Babinari, Sadat Visa, Port of Expert at Tanertat, but Orion, but on Bessarian Bukashut and Levan Mesora de Tanertat, Soret Am, Gadat Met Elevis, Ars, the Mishnu Bazeda, Mignebeze, Nadres, Guinda, Shemoktozo, Tais, Sayata shows of regional Shehodra, Sadat Chen Mogotseva Sasholeba, Gavizia Rotta, Nahoto, Moldova's practice. Nahot, Rainis Practicara, the Ra Shedegebi, the Ramolo di Nebisha, the Baria Urat Condes, Chuens Mokala Kebsat, the Picrobrom S. Regional Dialogue, Regian Jelova, the U Tiert Gatsula, I am practic is a Moxo Simas Rochuen, Zustatro, Ertoblevida Levit, Ertianat, Ukuk Etesat Gadavchrat, the Davget Botis Zebi, to Rogor Moakino, Tepectianat, Shades Leba Droshi Gat Eliot, Marepetian. Agnish Nuli Europol is a Samartos, but that's what Ilebebi. I met up the Gadav Sema as a fat established as Chinese Sakatos Adokata Associates, Taujudomaris, but on David Hasatians, Mogesalme with Pat on David, Dakt Hot Kahsnat as a fat Chinese conferencia. Didi Madlova. Newsal may be twenty webinaries, Monats Ileps, Trans Collegeps, Ukrainian, Moldovidan, Ratcom, the Cartwell, Eurysteps, Expert Eps, Martha Mishno, and Gadats, what in the bike, Namirebuli, Europis, Adam, Suplebatas, Asamartos, Mir, Uriatas, was there, Tislis, Yan Wars. But on the other hand, we have to make sure to do it. We have to to do it. We Europe's Adamiani Supleba Tasasa Martus Mier, Oria Tasosda, Tsilis Osda, Dianuars, Romitats, Dasulda, Rawats Liani, Sahem Sipota Shorisi Dava, Sakartolo, Namdek, Chenquelam Vitsi Tromesico, Nishlo and Gamarjeba, Sakartolo Swiss, the Asset Shepastais, Chenquelanashi, the Aquedavamat Ebdirom, Sahem Sipos Gamarjebas Tanertat. Es iko kartuli iuridiuli propesis gamar juvats. Romel mat sair to jamshi mogvit anai shedegi rom Strasbourgi sasa martos mie ragiare bulikna rusetis federatsis epekturi kontroli tskinualis regionis okupire bul teritori ebzeda ik chadenil shesava misk anon darwe vazerats da konvencis darwe vaz. Akedan gamom dinare es gamot tileba me dar tsum ne buli var zali an nishnolovani gamot gamot tileba ikneba chweni kolege bisatwis imkhe kanepshi sadats aris mzgavsi tipis probleme bi sadats adgiliya us okupatsias da rusetis federatsis mkhridan adamiani suplebe bis darwevas me binda. 
ისურვოთ წარმატებული ვებინარი, ასევე აღნიშნავ რომ მართლაც ძალიან მაღალი კლასის ექსპერტები არიან დღევანდელი სპიკერები როგორც საქართველოდან, ისე უკრაინიდან და მოლდოვიდან და მე დარწმუნებული ვარ რომ ეს იქნება ძალიან საინტერესო ვებინარი, საქმიანი თუ რა გავლენა შეიძლება იქონიოს ამ გადაწყვეტილებამ და ზოგადად სტრასბურგის სასამართლოს პრაქტიკამ ჩვენი ქვეყნების ადამიანების, ჩვენი ქვეყნების მოქალაქეების კონვენციური უფლებების დაცვის თვალსაზრისით და ამ ინიციატივისათვის გამოყოფდი და მადლობას გადაუხდიდი ინგაბერიძეს, რომელიც გახლავთ ჩვენი ადვოკატთა ასოციაციის ადამიანის უფლებათა კომიტეტის თავმჯდომარე, რომ ჩვენ მოგვეცა შესაძლებლობა ასეთი კარგი ღონისძიების ორგანიზებისა, ასევე მადლობას გადაუხდი მხარდაჭერისათვის ჩვენს საერთაშორისო პარტნიორებს ისტ-ვესტ მენეჯმენტ ინსტიტუტს პროლოგს და ყველა იმ ჩართულ და მხარდამჭერ ადამიანს რომელიც მეცადინეობითაც მოხდა რომ დღევანდელი ღონისძიება შედგა. კიდე ერთხელ დიდი მადლობა და წარმატებულ ვებინარს გისურებ და გემშიდობებით. ინგა გამართულია თქვენი ხმა ინგა ინგა მიკროფონი უნდა ჩართო ეს ეგი მე თუ ეს დამემართებო და ამას ვერ წარმოვიდგენი კეთილი კიდე ვერთხელ მადლობა ბატონო დავით ასეთი ა შინაარსიანი და წარდგენისთვის კონფერენციის დაწყების და იმ პირ ისადმი და პირთათვის და ორგანიზაციებისთვის სამადლობელისთვის რომელსაც მართლა გულითა და დუერთდები მინდა ვფა რომ პირველ რიგში უღრმესი მადლობა ჩვენს ადამიანის უფლებათა დაცვის კომიტეტს ასევე ძალიან მინდა გამოყო ბატონი ნიკოლოზ ლეგაშვილის წვლილი რომ სწორედ მისი დამსახურება რომ დღეს ჩვენ ასეთი ექსპერტები ყავს უკრაინიდან მოლდოვიდან და ასევე საქართველოდან და თვითონ ექსპერტს უბრუნეს მადლობა და ყველაზე დიდი მადლობა ალბათ რომ არა აღმოსავლეთ დასავლეთის პარტნიორობა ორგანიზაცია პროლოგი და მათი მხარდაჭერა თარგმნის უზრუნველყოფაში და ტექნიკურ უზრუნველყოფაში ალბათ აი ამ სიკეთეს დღეს ვერ ხედა ვერ ნახა ვიდა ჩემთვის როგორც არა მარტო ადვოკატისთვის ასევე როგორც ლექტორის მნიშვნელოვანია რომ ჩვენ შეხვედრა სტუდენტები ესწრებიან და სტუდენტებისთვის და ამ თაობისთვის ე ორ ენაზე იქნება ხელმისაწვდომი ეს ინფორმაცია და უფრო კარგად გასააზრებელი კეთილი ბოდი სტუბიხტი თუ ასე ვთქვათ ცოტა ზედმეტი ინსტრუქცია ეს გაკეთება მომიწევს თარგმანთან დაკავშირებით არის ჩატჩიც მოწერილი და კიდევ ერთხელ ვთქვით რომ ეს ეგ ინგლისურზე ინგლისური იქნება ხოლო გერმანულზე ქართული ენა იქნება ხელმისაწვდომი ურჩილ ეს აქვთ ხოლოთ რომ მიქონები ამოვთოთ და აღნიშნული ფუნქცია რა თქმა უნდა არის მარცხენა მხარეს ქვემოთ განთავსებული და მე მინდა წარგიდგინოთ თქვენ დღეს პირველი ასე ვთქვათ ექსპერტი კონფერენციის ევგენი ტუბილენკო რომელიც გახლავთ ასე ვთქვათ უკრაინიდან უფროსი ლექტორი მეცნიერებათა დოქტორის სამართალში საერთაშორისო შედარებითი სამართლის განყოფილების ყოფილი უფროსი პროფესორი ასე ვთქვათ ტალკენის იურიდიული სკოლის კიევის საერთაშორისო უნივერსიტეტის საერთაშორისო სამართლის პროფესორი რომელიც მიმოიხილავს უკრაინის ყველა ძირითად საქმის მოკლე მიმოხილვა სხვადასხვა სასამართლოში ტრიბუნალში და არბიტრაჟში ხოლო ბატონო ასე ვთქვათ ევგენის ეხლავე მისი პრეზენტაციაც ამოჩდება ეკრანზე ა დია ხო გიწვევთ ბატონო ევგენი hello to everybody uh, thank you very much for invitation it's really great honor and great great pleasure for me to be here today Actually, I need to make small remark. I represent Estonia here, not Ukraine. 
because I'm currently a citizen of Estonia, even if I have some Ukrainian roots and I was head of Ukrainian community in Estonia for several years. Um, and indeed, I will make the brief overview of different uh, cases, Ukraine versus Russia in different international courts, tribunals and arbitrations. I indeed believe that uh, it's very important to uh, exchange uh, our experience because there are a lot of uh, similarities, as it was mentioned already, uh, between Georgia and Ukraine. And uh, Ukraine uh, took a lot uh, using Georgian experience, in particular in International Court of Justice, which I will mention in a few minutes. Uh, furthermore, I truly believe that Georgia also can take some Ukrainian experience because, as you will see, Ukraine has quite a broad range of lawfare in different uh, international institutions. Uh, probably, of course, uh, we should start uh, from the International Court of Justice. There, Ukraine has, as you can see, a case against Russia as to two uh, international convention, International Convention on Prohibition of All Forms. No, it's a previous slide yet still, please. Uh, was switched on too, too quickly uh, because uh, the first case was a uh, case um, uh, as to the convention on uh, prohibition of all forms of uh, uh, racial discrimination as well as case on the uh, financing of terrorism. And actually why uh, this case was so important uh, and why uh, Georgian experience was very important because Actually, Georgia tried also to sue Russia using the jurisdictional clauses of uh, same conventions, but unfortunately, uh, Georgia did not uh, actually fulfill criteria of pre-trial uh, settlement of the dispute. And because of that, uh, International Court of Justice rejected the Georgian appeal. Uh, then Ukraine decided also to address uh, the same convention in the International Court of Justice. Georgian negative experience was taken into consideration by Ukrainian lawyers and all those attempts to organize pretrial Settlement was organized. Of course, it was absolutely useless because it was clear from the very beginning that Russia is not interested in such settlement. Meanwhile, it was a formal requirement of International Court of Justice and respectively, it was necessary to proceed with the case. Uh, as a result, Ukraine already have uh, a preliminary decision of International Court of Justice. Uh, objections of Russia were actually rejected by uh, International Court of Justice. Uh, furthermore, the preliminary measures were prescribed by the International Court of Justice, in particular as to the prohibition of uh, uh, Mijlis of Crimean Tatar people by Russian occupiers in Crimea, as well as uh, basically uh, limitation of education and Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar language in uh, Crimea as well. But uh, even uh, such intermediate decisions of the International Court of Justice were traditionally ignored by the uh, Russian occupiers. And I hope, of course, it will uh, be taken into consideration by the courts. Uh, then uh, the case will be uh, decided uh, substantially. So the next um, case, uh, again, it's one slide ahead. Could, could you come back, please? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the, the another case, it's exactly the uh, arbitration. Arbitral tribunal was constituted under the Annex uh, 7 of the UN Accords Convention, and uh, the case was dedicated to the uh, maritime zones in uh, Black Sea and in Azov Sea. Actually, there was also an uh, intermediary decision of the uh, tribunal, Avart which uh, actually rejected the majority of Russian objections. Uh, the only one Russian objection was accepted, in particular the fact that a court could not uh, discuss the questions of the sovereignty over the Crimean territory. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, two more cases we have in the permanent court of arbitration. Actually, all those cases are 
uh, happened in the Peace Palace in Hague because Beige actually it's a seat of the both International Court of Justice as well as Permanent Court of Arbitration. Actually, uh, it's a case uh, first of all of the national joint stock company Naftagas of Ukraine versus Russian Federation as well as joint stock company commercial bank private bank and finance company uh, Senior Loan Limited uh, Company versus Russian Federation. Uh, Walls uh, arbitrations are also valid, ongoing. Uh, so I think uh, that Ukraine has very good perspectives in uh, both cases. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another very interesting case uh, Ukraine has in the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which is located in Hamburg. Uh, and actually, uh, this case uh, is related uh, to the famous uh, story then uh, Russian uh, uh, military ships attacked uh, Ukrainian uh, military uh, vessels. Then uh, after that, they were captured. Uh, also, the International Tribunal uh, issued a award that a preliminary award that all uh, members of the crew should be returned as well as vessels actually uh, action of russia was a bit hypocrite because it was not just unconditional return uh, they returned the uh, sailors uh, in the process of exchange of so-called prisoners of war with ukraine or detainees of course it's also very tricky situation because uh, Ukraine uh, returned to Russia real terrorists who organized you know killing of civilians who participated in uh, illegal military activities on Ukrainian territory but instead of uh, of them uh, Ukraine received we can say hostages because it was not only the Ukrainian sailors but also people who were arrested in Crimea in Russia itself under the 100% falsified, uh, falsified uh, allegations. Uh, meanwhile, still uh, cases pending and substantial decision is still uh, expected. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another very interesting case uh, we can see in the International Court of Arbitration of the International Chamber of Commerce. It's uh, actually a state saving bank of Ukraine versus uh, Russian Federation. And actually uh, uh, a bank already won the case in the arbitration, but uh, Russia appealed the decision in the French courts. And currently uh, French court decided that uh, arbitration uh, didn't have proper jurisdiction. But now Ukraine also appealing the uh, decision, so case is also ongoing. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, uh, we have a number of the cases uh, in the European Court on Human Rights. Actually, I will not uh, discuss uh, questions Ukraine versus Russia, because uh, my colleagues will talk about it later more in detail. So just simply you can see here the main cases. Uh, I'm not talking about individual cases because there are a lot of individual cases and we also will have presentation on individual cases. But here you can see cases and we're talking about state uh, versus Russia and actually pay your attention with one case is um, together with Netherlands. It's actually a case relating the uh, shut it down of MH17 Malaysian Airlines flight. Uh, next slide, please. And actually, the, the last international uh, court, which I would like to mention, it's International Criminal Court, ICC, also in Hague. Uh, this court already uh, finished its preliminary investigation and according to the statement of the procurator of ICC, as you can see, the statutory criteria for opening of investigations into the situation in Ukraine are met. So I'm pretty sure that as Russia, Russian occupiers committed, we can say full range of all possible war crimes in Eastern Ukraine, uh, actually the uh, 
investigation will discover all of them and International Criminal Court uh, will uh, uh, deliver its decision. But what is already very important, I would like to stress that, that in the preliminary investigation, uh, International Criminal Court clearly stated that we have international armed conflict in Eastern Ukraine between uh, Ukraine and Russian Federation. It's, it's very important because, as you know, Russia uh, stubbornly denies all participation of Russian troops. Uh, meanwhile, a number of international institutions like PASE, like OSCE, NATO, European Union, uh, etc., they already clearly in different official resolutions. Uh, qualified situation is Russian military aggression against uh, Ukraine, in particular in Eastern Ukraine, uh, but it was always kind of soft law. Uh, here we already have uh, opinion of International Criminal Court, even if it was opinion in the preliminary investigation report, but still it clearly stated also that it's an international armed conflict between Russian Federation and Ukraine, which is very important as to qualification of the case. So uh, uh, that's basically it, very short overview, but uh, as you've seen in the program, uh, my colleague will provide you more information about specifically European Court and Human Rights cases of Ukraine. Thank you for your attention and thank you for invitation one more time. Madloba, but on Elgeni, signed a resume of Sanabistis. Echla of Shemdeg experts, but on Pesari and Bohashus, Romains Kapo, Kairosa, the Mesu, Clevata, Umaglesi, Commissaries, Opisis, Opisis, Armumat, Genelis, Akatoloshi, Missi, Moxene Behaba, Sahems, Proshoriso. Irreli sakmis dirtat saketeb ta axul basen da kafshiri bul tavi sebulebs. Khod batun desarian. Thank you very much, Inga. If you are so kind, just to give me the uh, competences of the host in order to share the presentation. Unfortunately, I'm not in position to do that just now. Perfect. Kad moketit. First of all, uh, thank you very much for organizing this very interesting conference, notwithstanding that because of this bloody pandemic, it's held in virtual terms. And nevertheless, I'm very pleased to meet all of you, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, especially, I'm very interested in listening to my Ukrainian colleagues and it's a little bit uh, awkward, I would say in brackets, that uh, here we are, the representatives of the legal society of the countries which have lodged with the European Court of Human Rights and international courts. I think the record number of uh, interstate applications, you know, about uh, against Russian Federation. At the present moment, just to give you a very simple statistics, four cases have been lodged uh, against Russian Federation by Georgia and nine cases are pending uh, lodged by the Ukraine against Russian Federation on different aspects and different factual circumstances. Um, as Inga has already mentioned, uh, I will spend my time, my 10 minutes on overviewing the very first interstate application which was lodged by Georgia back in 2007 and it was the very first application, I mean the interstate application, which was lodged with the permanent court after the reform has been implemented after Protocol 11 has entered into force. And back in the nineties. Uh, so uh, as you might be aware, in 2007, Georgian government has decided to lodge the first interstate case with the European Court of Human Rights. Let me just very briefly remind you the factual circumstances. 
after a number of arrests by Georgian authorities of Russian so-called spies and officers of different intelligence agencies, uh, mainly of GERU, uh, as we call it, then uh, the relationship and uh, links with uh, diplomatic links, as well as number of some kind of uh, very unusual things have taken place in the Russian Federation against Georgian nationalism, nationals who were residing there. Especially that began after September of 2007, uh, 2006, sorry. And approximately, as you can see, for example, in my, uh, on, on the slides, and those are the extracts from the decision and the judgment of the court, approximately 4,600 uh, persons have been uh, forcefully expelled from the from Russian Federation. Uh, approximately half of them have been firstly and initially detained and arrested and then based on the court's decision they have been expelled uh, to Georgia. Variety of means have been used by Russian Federation to transport them. They have organized four charter flights and then Georgia has organized two charter flights in order to bring uh, Georgian nationals from Russian Federation. Uh, the statistics of those who have been uh, deported from uh, Russian Federation to Georgia has sharply risen uh, in comparison with uh, the statistics which were available and presented by Russian Federation to the European Court of Human Rights in June. For example, in the first half of 2006, averagely approximately 40 to 100, uh, sorry, 80 to 100 individuals were deported while in the, uh, in the lap of time of uh, September and of 2006 and January 2007, approximately, 700 to 800 individuals were deported per month. So it was very clear for Georgian authorities, as well as for human rights monitoring bodies, that some administrative practice was taking place, which was orchestrated by the Russian Federation against Georgian nationals who were forcefully deported from Russian Federation during that period, that exact period of time. Uh, Firstly, uh, I can recall to the, to the period when the decision was taken by the European Court, uh, by the by Georgian government to lodge an uh, interstate case. On the, one, on the one hand, there was uh, quite a big chance to stretch the uh, links and also communication with the Russian Federation, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, that was the only way, only way for Georgian government just to challenge and appeal, you know, the uh, conduct of Russian authorities, which Georgian government has considered to contravene the very spirit and the wording of number of provisions secured by uh, under the European Convention on Human Rights. During that process, Georgia has tried its best to collect all the evidences, including from the centers and uh, isolators where Georgians were kept. And we have managed that time to obtain even video recordings of those who were kept in uh, Russian isolators and submitted to the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Number of activities have been implemented by government authorities in order to interview all those who have been expelled and deported uh, from Russian Federation and submit their testimonies to the European Court of Human Rights. Subsequently, Russian Federation was requested to uh, provide uh, and to give to the European Court uh, those uh, so-called so secret uh, circulations uh, and orders on the bay based on which Russian authorities have arrested, then kept in detention and then, uh, then deported uh, Georgian nationals. So firstly, Russia has denied 
uh, to provide those documents to the European Court. And the first violation which the European Court has stated in its judgment was a violation of Article 38, which obliges member states of the Council of Europe and high contracting parties to the European Convention to cooperate effectively with the court. Uh, Russia has denied to provide those so-called secret orders and circulates, uh, circulars, and therefore the court considered that there was a violation of uh, Article 38. Uh, subsequently, court has devoted uh, special emphasis and special attention to alleged violation of Article 4 of Protocol 4, which prohibits collective expulsion of aliens. And the court has found, based on its uh, case law, especially in the case of Tsonka, as well as in Hirsi Jama case, it found that there was very similar circumstances and it has not deviated from its previous case law and considered that the facts provided by uh, Georgian authorities were, were sufficient in order to establish violation of Article 4 of Protocol 4 because that was an administrative practice. Uh, the uh, Russian courts who were formally dealing with the expulsion and deportation orders were devoting only five minutes to each individual case. And it made clear for the court this practice that it was an administrative one. So the court has established violation of Article 4 of Protocol 4. Subsequently, the European Court has dealt with uh, alleged violation of Article 5 of the European Convention on Human Rights, and it was satisfied by the evidences submitted by Georgian authorities that in a number of cases, Article 5 has been infringed and violated by representatives of Russia Russia Federation because of unsubstantiated and unlawful arbitrary arrest of Georgian officials and their detention in the, isolators, in, in the isolators of temporary detention. Uh, also, as I have already mentioned, author, Georgian authorities were alleging violation of Article 3 of uh, European Convention based on the conditions which Georgian nationals were placed uh, during the deportation and expulsion. And court was satisfied with all the evidences submitted by Georgian side, and it has found violation of Article 3 based on those arguments. So the interesting fact in that regard was that back in 2014, when the decision, when the judgment was delivered, the European Court has said that it was not ready to deliver the judgment with regard to just satisfaction related issues. That's usual in court's practice. I would like to recall to the very first uh, interstate case and the judgment of uh, Cyprus versus Turkey when the court has adopted its main decision, I mean judgment in 2001 and then subsequently it needed some more 13 years in order to deliver the decision and the judgment on just satisfaction against Turkey. And subsequently, on the very same year when our first interstate case was uh, delivered in 2014, the uh, court has delivered the judgment uh, on just satisfaction against Turkey and it has awarded 90 million euros to the Cyprus because of the case it has dealt with 13 years uh, earlier than the just satisfaction judgment. So in this case, uh, in 2014, the court said that it was not ready for uh, delivering the judgment on just satisfaction. However, we needed five, only five years in comparison with Turkey, with, three, uh, with Cyprus, sorry, uh, to obtain the just satisfaction judgment. Firstly, the Georgian and Russian authorities were uh, proposed by the court to achieve certain type of consensus about the amount of just satisfaction. However, 
during one year, Georgia and Russia have not achieved any consensus and haven't reached, you know, any some kind of uh, possible point for solving this issue. And then the court has taken on its shoulders the decision to deliver the exact amount which was delivered some two years ago uh, in 2019. And having assessed all the evidences at its uh, hands, the court has decided to award uh, uh, 10 million euros to those who have been uh, to Georgian uh, the government and mainly to those approximately 1,500 individuals uh, whose list was uh, presented and submitted by Georgian authorities before the court. The interesting issue is that after interstate case was delivered, uh, the judgment was delivered. Then the court has followed the examination of number of individual cases which were brought by deported and expelled individuals. Back in 2017, then the court has adopted two very important decisions on individual cases. The first one was Shioshvili versus Russia about the pregnant woman who has experienced a number of difficulties and forceful stay in uh, Derbent in uh, Russia uh, while she was traveling uh, in train to reach Baku. And the second one was Berzenishvili and others versus Georgia. So I can present here, for example, the amount of those uh, uh, sums and just satisfaction amount, which was awarded to each and every individual uh, against Russia, in case you are interested, I do spot that I have already over exceed, exceeded, you know, the time which was allocated to me. So I'm placing myself at your complete disposal to provide any clarification in case of your interest. Thank you very much. Madlobat on the Sarianda or Picrop or Shek it could be so Anel she Chen Shouts left her it could be so das master. Damn it, everything for Matsi is Mirevas. Echla nominda of Tobo experts with Alia Levitz, Cabot on with Alias, Ukraine, Helsinki, Sadam is a clever cow she did, Professor Tatok at him, we see him at Armatino, so got him who Adam is a clever hair, also some of the shares of the individual sacrifice, or Melit Sheba, Shearebu of Ukraine's arm solid natural she. Vitalia's two ox present at Sia, Ohost of us cut out some anacto. Unfortunately, I haven't, so I will speak without presentation. Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. Thank you for having me today in this conference and for such opportunity to share my experience and how it will be useful for you. Uh, first of all, let me tell you about myself. I'm a lawyer of the Strategic Litigation Center at the Ukrainian Health and Human Rights Union. It's the association of uh, Ukrainian NGOs and we deal with a wide range of human rights uh, uh, protection and the struggle with human rights relations through different means, including education, advocacy and legal representation. Since the beginning of the armed conflict in Ukraine in 2014, uh, I represent the interest of victims in the European Court of Human Rights. And my topic is dedicated to the analysis of individual cases pending before the European Court concerning the armed conflict on the East. So I will speak about the relation of individ and individual application I personally have dealt with as a lawyer during the last five years. 
As a result of aggression of Russian Federation and the occupation of part of Ukraine, uh, thousands of people uh, have suffered violation of their rights under almost all of articles of the conventions. And according to the European Court, uh, about 7,000 individual applications are currently pending before the court. Uh, European Court decided to consider individual cases after the judgment in the interstate case Ukraine versus Russia. And the hearing of this case by the Grand Chamber is scheduled uh, uh, for 15 September this year. And the key issue uh, that is going to be examined by the court is the question uh, about the jurisdiction. And decision of this issue will form the basis for the consideration of individual application. Uh, by the way, as of today, the court has already considered three cases on merits that are related to the conflict uh, on the East, uh, but these cases were only against Ukraine and didn't cover the issue of jurisdiction. Uh, so these cases are Cesar and other versus Ukraine, Hlebik versus Ukraine, and Kurichenko and Zolotuhin versus Ukraine. And if uh, uh, somebody is interested in, um, in numbers of this case, so I may share the information uh, in the chat. So let me provide some details about these judgments. Uh, the case Cesar and others versus Ukraine unite seven application of Ukrainian citizens who were living at the occupied territory. And they complained that the state illegally suspended their pensions and they stated that they were deprived of the right to access to the court uh, it meant to Ukrainian court in connection with this violation, as Ukrainian court ceased their activities in the occupied territories, and also they complained of the violation of uh, Article 14, uh, discrimination on grounds of the residents. The court didn't found any violation of the applicant's right by Ukraine, and the main court's conclusion as to the right to access to the court under Article 6 is that Ukraine had taken all, me uh, all measures available to them uh, to organize a judicial system in the specific situation of ongoing conflict, uh, namely the court operating in the occupied territories uh, were relocated to uh, Ukrainian controlled territory. And the applicants had an opportunity to apply to this court, but they didn't use it. And as the applicant didn't provide evidence of their inability to reach the governmental control area, so the court didn't find a violation. And consequently, the court found the complaint under Article 1 to Protocol 1 uh, as to the social benefits inadmissible as the applicant didn't raise this issue before the domestic courts. Two other court judgment, uh, Hlebik versus Ukraine and Kurichenko and Zolotuhin versus Ukraine relate to the problem of loss of materials of criminal proceedings against the applicants that remained uh, at the occupied territory. And as a result, the criminal case could not be heard by national court. Uh, both of cases were represented by lawyers of our organization, and the interesting thing is that in the first case, the court didn't find the violation of the applicant's right under Article 6 and defined that domestic authorities have done all in their power under the circumstances to address the applicant's situation. However, uh, in other case, uh, uh, it was uh, held uh, this year, Kurochen Konzultuhin versus Ukraine, the court came to another conclusion and uh, concluded that authorities failed to take all steps available to them to advance the examination of the applicants' cases, and uh, there had been a violation of Article 6, Paragraph 1. Uh, currently, in Ukraine, uh, there is a still problem in the legislation on the restoration of the case materials left in the occupied territories, and that led to the situation that uh, consideration of many criminal cases are blocked. Now let's move to the overview of the application that we lodged to the court. Uh, and since 2014, uh, uh, we sent approximately 300 applications concerning violation on the east of Ukraine, and the majority of applications were against two states, Ukraine and Russia. 
The first major wave of violations took place in summer 2014, involving mass capture of servicemen uh, and disappearance as a result of active phase of hostilities. And we lodged to the court application with the request to apply interim measures under Rule 39 of the rule of the court that were uh, satisfied in major of cases. Namely, we requested the court to oblige the states to take urgent steps in order to define the whereabouts of the persons or to, re to relieve them or provide medical assistance. I also would like to describe the main violation uh, related to the conflict on the East that were faced during work and to tell more about challenges uh, through litigation of these cases before the European Court. In all of the cases, the main challenge for us was to collect evidence that proved the jurisdiction, the effective control of Russia over the territory of Ukraine. For several years, we have been collecting information on the confirmation, the presence of Russian military and uh, Russian weapons and the management of military operation by, by Russia. In our organization, we have a documentary center and the monitors interview witnesses and victims and collect this evidence from uh, open sources of information and systematize it. As to the violations, so I'm gonna summarize them uh, following. So it's a right to life under article two, it's killing of servicemen and civilians. Uh, there are also cases of extrajudicial killings of Ukrainian servicemen, as well as civilians, killings of wounded soldiers, cases of missing in action. Uh, illegal detention and tortures, almost all people who were captured at the occupied territory were subject to ill treatment and the aim uh, was to get information from the detainees. Also, there are lots of cases of absence to access to medical care and improper condition of detention. In addition to persons detained by illegal armed groups, a large number of convicts serving a sentence, uh, as well as persons who were not being convicted, but who were detained by enforcement bodies before the occupation on suspicion of committing crimes, still uh, remain in the occupied territories, uh, in prisons, uh, and the issue of their transportation to the territory controlled by Ukraine is within the competence of the Ombudsman, and some uh, have already been transferred to Ukraine, but the process uh, is progressing rather slowly. And today my colleague, uh, Alexander Polichenko would outline this issue in more details during session three. The other violation that we faced is uh, forced labor. Uh, many of illegal detainees were forced to perform various uh, jobs, including those that uh, were life-threatening, and such as working in fields uh, where there were mines or work at landfills where artillery shelling took place. And there were cases when the detainees were forced to work with uh, uh, different hazardous substance and uh, transportation of ammunition and detainees were severely punished for refusing to perform such work. Um, also right for, to fair trial. Nowadays at the occupied territory uh, were created the courts uh, of so-called Donetsk and Luhansk people republics and such courts are hearing the cases against the illegally detained people. And these courts cannot be considered as legally created ones in the meaning of Article 6 of Convention. Moreover, detainees do not have real and effective procedural rights. As a rule, they are formally appointed the so-called uh, state attorney. And it all comes down to the fact that uh, the person is forced to admit his or her guilt and sign all the document on accusation. Uh, Article 7, no punishment without law. Detainees uh, uh, are usually accused of espionage for a foreign country. Uh, that means for Ukraine, under the criminal court, uh, criminal code of an unrecognized republic. And uh, uh, the, in fact, this code is the copy of the criminal code of the Soviet Union. Uh, 
we also complain on violation on Article 8, uh, right to respect private and family life in conjunction with Article 3 and uh, Article 1 to Protocol 1. Um, and uh, many of Ukrainians are detained and prosecuted at the occupied territories because of their pro-Ukrainian position. So it's also a violation of Article 10, freedom of expression. Uh, right to, to property. Uh, with regard to this right, there are several types of cases. Uh, case of destruction of applicants' property as a result of artillery shelling, uh, case of confiscation of property by illegal armed groups and inability of applicants to access their property. They're located in the occupied territory due to the risk of detention. Uh, of course, this is not an uh, exhausted list of violations uh, that I have noted, uh, but I mentioned the most uh, uh, systematic and massive in the occupied uh, territory. Of course, the experience of Georgia is very important for us, and we will refer to the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights in case uh, Georgia versus Russia. Uh, however, I must note that in the judgment, uh, there are some conclusions of the court that is rather um, have some negative, may have some negative uh, effect to the case of Ukraine. I mean, such conclusion that the court didn't find uh, effective control of Russia during the active phase of hostilities. And we have uh, many uh, cases, uh, violation committed exactly during the active phase of the armed conflict, uh, especially in 2014 and in 2015. It is illegalized cattle and with the huge invasion of Russian servicemen uh, and the defense of the Netsk airport in January 2015. And uh, if the court didn't find the effective control of Russia during this period, so it may mean that no violation would be found. Um, uh, thank you for your attention, uh, and I will be glad to answer your uh, two questions. Kitilli <laughs> Lokots <laughs> Thank you, Inga. Thank you. Hello, everybody, again. Um, uh, it was very important and, and really interesting to hear our colleagues from Ukraine, uh, especially because of the connections and, and uh, similarities uh, uh, with Georgian cases already lodged before the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, this is really important uh, outcomes of this uh, uh, judgments uh, concerning uh, um, Georgian case, which we already have in uh, Crimea, the Crimea case, which is actually considered admissible uh, uh, several weeks ago uh, before this judgment uh, delivered by the court, I mean, Georgian judgment. So, uh, and, and uh, in my speech, I will be uh, uh, talking about this in detail, but but now uh, let's uh, move to another, uh, our panelist, our brilliant panelist, uh, Tina Goritiani. Uh, she's an associate professor of international law at Ilya State University. And then uh, she will be talking about, uh, uh, about this case, about Georgia versus Russia two case, second uh, case, uh, about the key points uh, and then conclusions and, and prospects, uh, which, is, which is really important and really interesting, I guess. So, uh, Tina, floor is yours. And, and... Thank you very much. Um, I hope I'm um, audible. Um, so... Um... Microphone, microphone. 
Is Miss Rom? Yes, so I can I can proceed, right? You can. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So um, thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to discuss um, to be here today. Um, uh, and we've uh, already heard a very interesting, uh, stimulating and thought provoking presentations. Um, I myself have a couple of questions for the uh, for the for the panelists um, and. Uh, well, today I would like to use this opportunity and uh, without going into a general overview of the, of the case, uh, Georgia versus Russia, actually, um, identify several questions that I myself had while uh, reading and analyzing the case and uh, what kind of repercussions this judgment um, could have for the um, interstate cases uh, and individual um, um, cases, especially which relate to the protection of rights. I'm terribly sorry. I can I can't hear uh, Tina. Maybe the, there's there is something uh, even uh, translator either. So uh, I, I guess uh, I have some technical problems. Uh, I just so we can hear Tina. Yeah, I also can hear. Thank you very much. Maybe um, that's just the one problem. Uh, so should we fix it or should I stop or should I? You, you may go ahead, please. Well, uh, we have to find the right channel probably for, for listening to you. Right. All right. So, with uh, with uh, with the agreement of general public, I will move uh, um, continue. So, um, and um, what I think is that might be the problem of um, protecting or the assessing the situation of human rights during the and especially the right to life during the armed conflicts, uh, because uh, this was the biggest the problematic issue of the. Of the um, of the judgment. Other than that, uh, I consider um, this case um, a major win for Georgia because this is the first time when we had an international um, judicial body which established that in course of uh, 2008 international armed conflict, Russia actually violated its international law obligations. Now, the problem um, uh, with the with with the jurisdiction, right, in relation to Article Two, which is the right to life. Now, as you all know, the court actually split the consideration, a factual consideration of the of the case into um, the phase of active hostilities, which is from August eight to August twelve, and the court call it um, context uh, named that as a context of chaos and uh, subsequent events. Now, the problematic issue is actually the, um, the, the, uh, the uh, issue of the um, hostility phase. Now, um, what I see here, and I would like to suggest you looking, discussing this issue from the, from the prism of two very pertinent issues of public international law, which is um, extraterritorial jurisdiction of states and the consequent state responsibility. And the second, applicability of the convention to the situations of armed conflicts. And we know that the both cases are both issues are very um, per pertinent to, to, to two interstate cases, uh, as well as to, um, to individual cases. Now, the, in, in terms of extraterritoriality, um, the, we all know that there is a well-established approach that jurisdictional competence of a state is primary territorial. And there are very um, extreme, um, um, exceptional cases where the extraterritorial um, jurisdiction of the state uh, extends beyond the territory. Now, um, the court in assessing the Georgia versus Russia case used two tests. First was the effective control test. Second was the uh, state agent authority test. Now, in terms of um, uh, effective control test, um, the, this, this test is connected to the control of the territory, of the area. And the court said that, yes, um, there were Russian um, uh, or proxy troops, armed forces on this territory. However, and there was an international armed conflict. However, the very reality of armed confrontation and the fighting between the belligerent um, parties um, leads us to believe that 
that they are seeking to establish the control over territory. And which means that there is a context of chaos. Uh, and this leads the court led the court to believe that there is no control over the area, no control over the area of anyone. That's my generally, that's my understanding, which also raises different type of issues than who would would, would then the territorial control against that logic also apply. But the court doesn't go that far. Now, um, after reaching that conclusion, the court went to another task, state agent authority task. And this is the actually physical power, physical control of a person, control over the persons. This is how the court in this case law, case law defines this test. Now, here the court also noted that there was a military operation um, ongoing, uh, shelling, bombardment, artillery fire, and there was a difficult in step, um, difficulty in establishing the authority over um, individual. And the court substantiated this conclusion um, uh, as noted in paragraph 141 um, by, uh, and I would like to cite, the large number of alleged victims and contested incidents, magnitude of the evidence produced, the difficulty in establishing the relevant circumstances, and the fact that such situations are predominantly regulated by legal norms uh, other than those of the convention, unquote. Now, what does this mean in practice? Um, and how this could, um, re uh, could affect other cases? Um, or simply said, is it a return to the, uh, the, to the Bankovic judgment where the court reached the conclusion um, in relation, the conclusion that um, the, uh, there was no special jurisdiction in relation to the aerial bombardment by NATO of the, CV, uh, of the Serbian TV station. The facts of these two cases are pretty much, ver um, are very difficult. And I'm sorry, different. In case of Georgia um, versus Russia, we also, we, it was not only the aerial bombardment, we also had a ground troops and ground combat. Um, and you would agree with me uh, that this kind of use of armed forces, the troops, troops can actually control wholly or partially the territories, even during of the theater of war, even during armed conflict especially if using, if using with the use of modern means and methods of warfare. Now, if I generally assess uh, the, this conclusion of the court, uh, from my perspective, this is um, quite a generalization or oversimplification of the situation. Yes, we would agree that it is difficult to establish facts, gather evidence, um, on the cases during the um, active phase of, of, of hostilities. Uh, but should this be a reason to have a, such a restrictive approach to the issue of extraterritorial jurisdiction? Uh, or for instance, as the, um, uh, was voiced by several, um, so already several scholars, um, for the action, for the, for, for the situation, for the activity of the, um, of the forces, um, which would, if these activities would be conducted during, uh, within the territory of country, the country would, uh, the, would be, um, the, the jurisdictional link would have been established. What changes in terms of the extraterritorial application of those kind of actions? Now, um, it, it is, from my perspective, some very easily, very um, diligently summarized in the dissenting opinion of, um, judges including Pinto de Albuquerque, Yudivska and Cherturia, where they noted that this kind of interpretation is not in the spirit of the convention. Uh, it's very restrictive, restrictive actually the rights um, of uh, the possibility of the court to protect rights and freedom of persons during the armed conflict. Um, uh, now, in relation to um, individual cases. Um, so in terms of the other interstate case, definitely that um, could be a challenge that, um, that the, the states would have to overcome and the court itself had, would, be, um, would have a, a barrier to overcome, how to interpret, reinterpret and reapply this issue, this case, um, this um, uh, judgment. But in terms of individual cases, 
Um, I think that um, the court might not have be as strict as, um, as, um, as an interstate case. Why? Uh, because um, the court uh, in, other, um, um, in, in other cases, which related also the, um, re which related the, to the issue of uh, state agent authority, um, use the element of proximity. So if in individual cases, we will have the um, issues related to the right of life of the individual um, uh, person or the group of persons, where you'll have this the easier to establish through the factual background, the element of proximity, most probably, most probably the court might um, step back and slightly um, um, and, and deviate from this very strict approach and restrictive approach of the interstate case, which usually is if you establish the, if you see generally the, 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 the threshold um, in terms of also the threshold of jurisdiction, um, the courts, and this is not only the European Court of Human Rights, but other international tribunals, they're much more, um, much more stricter when it comes to interstate cases than to individual, individual um, issues, individual um, cases. Now, um, the good thing, a good um, positive um, aspect of it is the investigation. Now, uh, even though the court said that um, the court, uh, Russia did not have a jurisdiction, extraterritorial jurisdiction in terms of the, for the purpose of Article 1 of the convention, the court still confirmed Russia's obligation to investigate deaths, even if they occurred during the hostilities. Um, and this is paragraph 331 of the, of the case. Now, this is kind of an um, a kind of a interesting point. The Professor Sozoli um, discussed that, um, uh, that um, it seems that the court established the procedural obligation without the need of establishing the substantial one. And uh, even though this um, is not very uh, well discussed, the logic, the rationale of the court is not very well discussed in the judgment. So um, this, this um, uh, undoubtedly will come into uh, will come into play into the um, in, in in cases of um, individual complaints. But we'll see how court um, would um, determine would interpret that approach uh, in 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 furtherance. I would like to go in details with this uh, on this issue. However, due to the time limitations, I would like to move forward. And if there are questions, I would like gladly discuss that. And the second point I would like to discuss with you is the issue of interplay between the international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Now, as we know, the, uh, leg, uh, the, the, during the armed conflicts, whether it is um, international armed conflict or non-international armed conflict, the uh, IHL, International Humanitarian Law, um, is the leg specialis, works, uh, applies all the time. So there is a debate um, for the last couple of decades in the, within the public international law field on the interrelation or interplay of these two bodies of law. Now, um, and there is already a very significant case law developed by um, the UN um, uh, human rights bodies by Inter-American Commission and the court on this issue, where it is um, underscored that during armed conflicts, the protection of human rights conventions does not stop, they continue. Um, the court had a, uh, European court had a very perfect opportunity to clarify this issue. Uh, to go into details how IHL would be a lex specialis and how human rights law would be le lex generalis and how would the interplay would, uh, would be there. However, the court didn't say that, uh, didn't say practically anything. In, article, in paragraph 142 um, of the judgment, court just said that um, if it wanted to, um, to be entrusted with this um, function, uh, it should be uh, the uh, um, contracting states, uh, countries had to provide the uh, necessary legal basis for this task, which says that, well, I'm not saying that I don't have that power, but also I, uh, I, I don't say that uh, I do have. But it is actually clarified from my perspective uh, in the concurring opinion of Judge Keller, where it is said that, and I would like to quote, had the court held otherwise as to the question of jurisdiction during the active phase of 
duties, its duty would have been to assess the conduct of respondent state in terms of international humanitarian law in order to resolve the applicant, applicant government's complaint under Article 2. Now, definitely it, it was, there was an expectation from the court that the court would discuss the, um, the application of Article 2 in terms of, in, in terms of international armed conflict. I'm not sure it was, we expected from them to discuss the international humanitarian law, um, but um, actually they didn't do it. Um, and as uh, factually and very wisely as stressed by Judge Grozov, uh, the, re uh, the reasoning of majority creates an impermissible legal vacuum in Europe, where whenever they have, uh, we have a situation of, um, uh, of armed conflict or war zone. Now, um, all these issues um, will be discussed in international, in, in interstate and, and um, individual complaints, obviously. Um, unfortunately, this judgment did not give answers to the questions that was expected. Um, why um, it did not? Because, um, um, and, and here I would agree with Professor Marko Milanovic when he noted that in his, uh, in his uh, um, several of his posts and interventions that actually the court's approach to this jurisdictional issue and interplay with international humanitarian law is a very political decision. Political not in terms of a state policy, but the policy of the court. They don't feel comfortable in discussing uh, IHL, in discussing uh, in international, um, international humanitarian law, in, um, which very closely relates to the uh, legality of user force and how the user force is used during the during the um, during the um, uh, operations. Uh, and we could see that in, for instance, already discussed the uh, uh, Ukrainian cases. Also, the courts always try to avoid this kind of um, uh, discussion, um, and. This is obviously here. Now, this actually leads us to believe that it will have repercussions in individual cases. Now, what type of repercussions it will be, what, what kind of effects it will be, we'll have to see. Um, in, in terms of interstate cases, I doubt that there would be um, too much um, diff, um, the, 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 the changing of the approach of the court too um, quickly, even though, um, if I'm not mistaken, number of judges will be changing quite soon within the courts. And we know that this also might have effect. Um, but in terms of inter, uh, individual cases, here we might have, um, uh, might have um, broader avenue for clarification of some of legal aspects which Georgia versus Russia raised, but actually didn't give a clear um, um, logic or clear rationale. This is something we should be expecting, especially in interstate. Uh, in uh, Tina, sorry, you have 30 more seconds. Very sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I will. Um, I, I actually would wanted to stop here. Um, and just one more thing that the, my conclusion, you might agree with me, you might not agree with me, is that overall, this judgment um, weakens the protection of the convention during the armed conflicts, which um, as shows um, the recent practice is not something um, very, um, um, it's quite often um, that there are armed conflicts, whether nation, uh, whether uh, inter, inter, uh, interstate or non-international uh, non arises in, the, uh, in, in Europe. So um, this is very, um, the, this is very sad However, this is the reality. I will stop here. I'm sorry if I, uh, if I took too much time. Um, um, just the issue is too broad. There are so many questions to discuss. Uh, and um, and th th this is Absolutely. the time to, to do that. Thank you. Absolutely agree with you that this is really, really broad topic. And thank you so much for this really, really, really brilliant presentation. Uh, uh, it was very interesting to hear uh, your presentation and, and I'm sure that we will have additional time uh, during the questions. Uh, and that we will have really interesting questions to ask you. And now uh, let's switch to our next panelist. My best friend from Moldova, Mr. Ion Manoli, he's executive director of Promolex based in 
uh, Moldova and then um, uh, his organization and he was uh, personally involved in this litigation uh, before the European Court of Human Rights had thousands of cases and, and uh, they already have uh, decisions uh, from the European Court of Human Rights and, and uh, I'm sure that you will all like his presentation. Uh, Mr. Yon, the floor is yours and uh, Thank you very much, Nicolas. Uh, dear colleagues and dear friends, uh, I'm very glad to be part of these discussions and the debates on these very important topics uh, for our countries affected by the military aggression and uh, separatism. I would like to start with a short presentation of my organization. From 2004, uh, Promolex Association started its activity also in the Transnistrian region of the country by providing legal assistance, human rights education, strategic litigation, advocacy efforts, and support for local uh, civil society activists and uh, groups. Uh, during the last 16 years, we represented victims of human rights abuses from Transnistrian region at the local, national, and international level. Our lawyers and defenders sent to the European Court more than 200 petitions from them, about 80 are from Transnistrian region. Starting with 2012, European Court published 25 decision, uh, decisions on uh, 54 Transnistrian cases, represented by uh, my uh, colleagues from Promolex. And uh, European Court recognized violation of different articles of European Convention. According to only two our 35 decisions, about 2,200 individuals, victim, victims of human rights abuses from Transnistrian region should receive about 5 million euro as compensation and damages. As a result, in 2015, local KGB office started so-called criminal procedures against Promolex and declared us persona non grata in the region. So our activity now continue to face serious obstacles uh, to travel in this region and to meet our uh, beneficiaries. After 33 European Court decisions, in my opinion, the most important aspects are Moldovan authorities remain and are responsible for human rights situation in the Transnistrian region of the country. Positive obligations continue to be one of the most important efforts to do from their side. Russian Federation is responsible as well for human rights situation in the territory because Russian government and different actors from Moscow have possibility to influence decisions on the local level. First of all, because they continue to support economically, socially, politically, military, and all these aspects, of course, contrary to their officially, official status, mediator, peacekeeper, and guarantee state. So, respectively, Moldova and Russia share the URI and de facto responsibility for human rights situation in the Transnistrian region of Moldova. But both of them, in reality, continue to ignore the situation on the ground. Moldova because of the lack of control, and Russia because of their dualistic messages and behavior. Russian authorities also refuse to execute European, decision, uh, European court decisions but we continue our advocacy efforts in this uh, direction. It is also important to mention here at least three leading cases represented by Promolex, which are very relevant for the European Court jurisdiction, but also for the similar cases from other so-called conflict zones. I mean, first of all, Georgia and Ukraine. First is Katan case. Uh, case of Katan, uh, you can find judgment from October 19, 12, uh, 2012, where the court concluded that so-called Transnistria was established as a result of Russian assistance. And uh, the second aspect from this decision is a Russification and the et ethnical clearing of, uh, in the occupied territory. The second leading case, in our opinion, uh, is case of Moser versus Republic of Moldova and Russia, decision from February 23, 2016, where the court concluded, that lack, uh, concluded the lack of legality of so-called courts, Transnistrian courts, I mean. And, and third case is Pisar case um, versus Russian Federation, 
where the European Court uh, of Human Rights held unanimously that there had been a violation of Article 2, right to life and investigation. So I would like to continue with some conclusions regarding the human rights situation in Transnistrian region of Moldova, including after the a long period of uh, representation of petitions to European Court. First of all, it will be relevant to underline that according to the official census from 1989 in the occupied territories, population was 755,000 people. From them, 40% Moldova Moldovans, 28 Ukrainians and 25 Russians. Only in 15 years, in 2004, According to the another census, operated by the local de facto separatist regime, population decreased to 555,000 people, where it's about one third. Where Moldovans decreased to 33%, Russians increased to 32%, and Ukrainians remain at the 28. After Russian Moldovan war in 92, agreement was, was signed by the Moldovan President Snegur and Russian President Yeltsin. From this moment, about 11% of territory and about 15% of population remained under the control of the separatist regime. Russian Federation, under the very strange circumstances, from aggressor became mediator, guarantee state and peacekeeper. And uh, here I will uh, make a short parenthesis. Uh, the situation is very interesting how Today, Russia tried to apply the same strategy for Ukrainian uh, conflict, for Ukrainian problems. I mean, similar uh, scenarios. Uh, constitutional authorities accepted to discuss and negotiate directly with the illegal regime, and all things and aspects were definitely complicated. Everything started to be confused, including the human rights, justice procedures, and so on. Negotiation format 5 plus 2 until 2005, 3 plus 2. Uh, include only political issues and exclude any kind of problems regarding the rights and liberties of the people inside the Transnistrian region. Political dialogue which excludes human rights aspects and elementary guarantees for the people cannot be efficient. We have this dialogue about 30 years and the result is obvious. Human rights are violated brutally in this area. Human rights are not monitored, are not promoted and cannot be practically defended. There are no rehabilitation instruments for the victims. Impunity is the most serious problem for the peace building processes. Impunity encourages perpetrators to continue their abuses and discourages people and victims to fight for their rights and to trust in the international law, international institutions and international mechanisms. So in these circumstances, we are convinced that only respect for human rights, guarantees for their fundamental rights and liberties are the most efficient instruments and elements for the peace building processes. All political formats should include obligatory human rights issues, first of all. Today we have less than half a million of people in the region. Most of them have Moldovan citizenship. But they, for them, we don't have efficient, we still don't have an efficient mechanism to protect and defend their rights. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. I am ready to, to participate in the uh, questions and uh, answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Jon. This is this very, very brilliant presentation. Honestly, I didn't know that uh, you have such a problem in your country, uh, but I hope that with mutual cooperation, uh, I'd like to suggest to our colleagues from Ukraine as well, we will be able to handle this you know, problems in our countries. Um, uh, and now at the moment we have a presenter, Sergei Zaitz. He's a lawyer, uh, founder of Just Crop Project in, in Ukraine. And, and he's exceptionally working on, on uh, Crimea cases. And his uh, specialization is uh, responsibility of an occupied state for displacement of local population and uh, uh, Article 2, Protocol Number 4 of the European Convention. So, uh, uh, dear uh, Sergei, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, thank you for uh, having me here today. And um, I would say that uh, the uh, presentation of uh, Mr. Manole was uh, 
like uh, introduction in my presentation because uh, I'd like to uh, speak uh, about uh, cleansing of the occupied territory uh, by the Russian uh, authorities. Uh, uh, as Nicholas uh, said, I'm a lawyer and uh, in uh, 2014 uh, I had to leave uh, the occupied uh, Crimea and now uh, I'm focused on human rights violations in the context uh, of the uh, uh, occupation and uh, uh, transfer of civil population is just uh, one of point, but it very, uh, as you see, it is very close uh, to my uh, own uh, situation. I have uh, some uh, dozens cases uh, regarding uh, human rights violations in uh, Crimea pending before the European Court. Uh, as you know, there is no uh, judgments regarding individual cases, uh, Crimean individual cases, and now uh, the European uh, Court uh, uh, has about a uh, uh, thousand uh, cases uh, regarding uh, Crimea uh, pending. Uh, so uh, part of uh, them are concerned of uh, violation of uh, freedom of movement, of freedom to choose a place of uh, residence. Uh, Georgian case has uh, a very small part uh, that regards uh, freedom of uh, movement, but uh, I say that it is very important uh, part of this judgment. Uh, um, I say that uh, this case about uh, practice of Russian uh, uh, authorities regarding cleansing of the occupied territory, about uh, uh, forced displacement. This case is uh, about uh, IDPs. I know that Georgia, Moldova, uh, and now Ukraine uh, uh, have uh, a lot of IDPs from uh, the areas of uh, conflict. And Georgian case, uh, as I know, is the first case that regards uh, uh, displacement in the context of conflict. Uh, and it's uh, very important uh, development in uh, the case law of the European Court, because there are some uh, cases of such uh, uh, kind in case law of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, uh, and uh, even in the practice of international tribunal for the former uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, despite uh, the fact that uh, in some uh, situations, uh, uh, um, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, highlight that it's important to uh, continue to develop such uh, practice uh, in, uh, b b before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, when we uh, talk about uh, forced displacement uh, in the situation on, of uh, such conflicts as we have in Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine, uh, this situation uh, amount to continuous violation. So uh, we have an opportunity, we are not limited with a six uh, month uh, rule and we have an opportunity to submit such cases to the European uh, Court without any uh, restriction by uh, time. And that is why it's very important I mean that, uh, for example, Georgian colleagues and uh, Moldovian colleagues can uh, submit such uh, cases uh, even now, despite uh, the time uh, spent after uh, the conflict. Uh, and uh, the main my point is uh, that 
uh, we have uh, forcible uh, the, the term of forcible uh, displacement is not restricted to physical force but uh, it may include a threat uh, of force or uh, coercion uh, and uh, situation where uh, there is no choice but to leave the occupied territory. Russia, uh, now Russia use, uses, um, I would say, uh, soft cleansing of uh, occupied territory and uh, forces uh, all unloyal uh, people to leave the occupied territory. Or, or, or at least to keep silence. Uh, and if we have no ev even um, a decision of uh, authorities that force uh, a person to leave the occupied territory, we have a uh, general uh, situation in occupied territories when uh, persons uh, deprived of their right uh, of uh, free speech, right of uh, assembly, uh, there is no right to uh, fair trial. Uh, and, uh, we have violation of uh, property rights in Crimea and so on. And that is why uh, people uh, cannot uh, feel uh, safe in the occupied territory then uh, this uh, situation uh, means that uh, people can not uh, protect uh, their uh, right to stay in the occupied territory, refusing from other uh, their uh, rights. As I said, freedom of speech, uh, property, and so on. And they, uh, that, that is why this situation uh, force, uh, as I said, unloyal, usually unloyal people, but no, uh, not in every case, to leave the occupied uh, territory. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, this uh, point uh, confirmed uh, uh, by case law of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. There are some uh, such cases like, uh, I'm not sure of the spelling, but uh, uh, Moewana community versus uh, Suriname, uh, Mapiripan massacre versus Colombia, and uh, Ituango massacres versus uh, Colombia. And we have, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh the case of the international tribunal for the former yugoslavia in uh, stakic uh, kraishnik and uh, uh, simic uh, uh, judgments when uh, we uh, can see that they they was there was no uh, uh direct forcible uh, displacement but there was uh, systemic violation of uh, human rights and uh, people had no uh, real opportunity to stay in the territory uh, of uh, conflict. So uh, uh, as I said, we have uh, such uh, individual case in Ukraine pending uh, before the European court, but as we, uh, again, uh, at the moment, we have no uh, uh, judgment. Uh, at all regarding conflict except a uh, decision on admissibility of the uh, interstate case regarding uh, Crimea. But uh, I'm sure that uh, these cases uh, can uh, develop uh, uh, the case of the uh, case law of the European Court of Human Rights. And the Georgian case is uh, very uh, important, uh, I would say, first step in this direction. Unfortunately, we uh, have no such uh, claims uh, included in uh, the interstate uh, case, uh, I mean, Ukraine versus uh, Russia. But I hope our government, uh, uh, after the uh, Georgian case, I hope that uh, the Ukrainian government will uh, submit one more uh, 
uh, application to the European uh, Court. But what we can do, and I invite uh, all of my colleagues from Georgia and from uh, other countries where uh, we have uh, such conflicts to submit individual cases to the European case regarding a violation of freedom of movement on, or, or to choose the place of uh, residence. And uh, as uh, it, uh, as I said, it is about violation of, of, of protocol four as it was in uh, the uh, Georgian. Uh, case uh, and I'm ready to provide comments to questions if any. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Sergey, for this really interesting um, uh, presentation. Uh, I see very uh, a, a lots of similarities with Georgian case, and, and I'm, I'm absolutely agree with you that uh, even now, when when so many years left uh, past, actually. We can we can lodge the application against the Russian Federation, and that that's, this is actually my motivation, uh, uh, which uh, I'm sharing with my colleagues. That uh, uh, there is a brilliant opportunity of cooperation with with Ukrainian and Moldovan colleagues to lodge as much as uh, it is possible uh, cases against Russia. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to be really. Uh, 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 taking the, the time uh, of my colleagues of our next uh, uh, oh, be, before before we have we will have our next panelist uh, we have a time for for questions for your questions uh, now you, you have my dear colleagues you have a good opportunity to ask questions to our uh, experienced colleagues working in in Moldova in in uh, uh, Crimea in Ukraine uh, generally and our brilliant presenter and panelist, uh, Tina Goletiani. Uh, she has brilliant presentation about these general uh, topics and really key points and findings of the, of the decision. So my dear colleagues, uh, uh, Inga, could you be able to help me with, with the questions if you have, or, or, or if, if we don't have, questions uh, we can switch our next next panelist but but this is opportunity for for uh, georgian lawyers to ask questions uh, to our experienced lawyers uh, as, as i can see now we don't have we don't have questions right so, but but anyway, uh, at the end of the our next panel, third panel, we will have uh, next opportunity for for our colleagues to uh, raise questions to our colleagues. Uh, and now, uh, I'd like to uh, ask my colleague from uh, Ukraine, Alexander Pavlichenko. Uh, who is the executive director of Ukrainian Health Sinki Human Rights Union, working in an uh, in enormous number of cases pending before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, but uh, he specifically will be talking about the deprivation of liberty, torture, and inhumane uh, treatment during detention. And next uh, uh, topic, uh, his topic will be sentence. Uh, person sentenced persons left on the occupied and non-controlled territory. So, dear Alexander, floor is yours. Thank you, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, sorry for torture uh, you uh, as a last speaker, and I will try to speak uh, uh, briefly and on substance of uh, the matter and uh, explain you uh, the uh, uh, position uh, and the number of the cases and the concrete uh, uh, topics that were considered by our lawyers uh, uh, in strategic cases lodged to the European Court of Human Rights and uh, to the International Criminal Court uh, 
Uh, and I uh, have to thank Tina Gulitiani uh, for raising the issue on the uh, uh, concurrence of the legal uh, mm, norms uh, mm, between IHL and the uh, 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 the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. <clears throat> uh, I've started the work uh, on the um, uh, accountability uh, of the crimes uh, uh, issued by the uh, war uh, conflict uh, in 2014 and uh, the first, uh, uh, as I may consider, substantial work is uh, the uh, report uh, uh, Surviving Hell, and I present here the English version of this text uh, with the uh, a short explanation why it is important for uh, the matter that we consider today. Uh, the uh, most significant uh, problem was uh, the atrocities uh, uh, um, uh, fulfilled by the uh, uh, Russian forces and their proxies in the uh, Donbass in the summer uh, and the fall of 2014 and in the, at the beginning of 2015, the uh, uh, most uh, strong and significant time of the war with the uh, uh, number of the uh, uh, killed, wounded, uh, and the uh, arrested or uh, detained persons. And uh, just uh, one number. Uh, 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 as to information, uh, the 1st October 2015, uh, 2,763 persons were released from the detention places uh, in occupied uh, uh, regions of Donetsk and Lugansk region. So it's just a single number that uh, prove the number of uh, the uh, concrete cases uh, related to the A, deprivation of liberty. Uh, uh, in the half of the cases, uh, uh, as uh, we consider the statistic, there were uh, the um, different types of inhuman treatment, tortures, uh, uh, even gender-based violence, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, I have to split the categories of the detained person because our uh, second part of the topic is the person in detention places. Uh, and we have to speak about a person that were sentenced by Ukraine before uh, 2014 in Crimea and in uh, uh, Donetsk, Lugansk regions, uh, in some reg uh, parts of these regions occupied and non controlled uh, for today by Ukrainian government. <clears throat> B, the uh, a combatant, uh, I mean the uh, representative of the military forces of Ukraine, uh, the uh, voluntary battalions, uh, and second part, the civil population uh, from the uh, territories that war, uh, uh, that uh, uh, was uh, um, mm, detained uh, under different uh, subjects for different reasons, uh, uh, sometimes even for uh, um, demonstration of Ukrainian symbols or uh, non-acceptance of uh, the fact uh, of the occupation uh, uh, this territory by uh, pro-Russian proxies and so on. And um, just uh, very concrete uh, numbers that you may find, uh, uh, for example, on the pages 21, 22, 23 from this uh, report, Surviving Hell, and I will refer for these numbers. Uh, we uh, organized several uh, trips to the uh, detention places that were on uh, controlled now by the uh, by this time by Ukrainian uh, side territories and we found uh, and opened more than 80 illegal detention places in Donetsk regions 
and uh, they were uh, placed uh, as it was it was mentioned uh, officially official number i uh, called it was 2700 uh, uh, with plus uh, some, some others but uh, uh, according to non official uh, calculation it was uh, uh, from five till 15,000 persons uh, detained in this illegal detention places. Uh, and uh, mm, the uh, conditions, when we are speaking about the uh, inhuman treatment tortures, uh, almost half of these uh, even so-called official detention places, like for example, mm, institution of uh, penitentiary systems uh, or uh, the uh, official uh, uh, establishment or uh, buildings like uh, Ministry of Interior and so on, uh, the persons were not in the uh, appropriate cells, but in the basement. Uh, almost half of the person, uh, persons were placed into the basement, or uh, as you may see uh, on this uh, 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 for example, uh, page uh, uh, 21, I guess, we see that the basement or vehicle shed or archives or uh, stairway or uh, uh, glass cabins and so on, uh, non-prepared uh, uh, places for the uh, uh, holding uh, the persons were used uh, for detention. and. Even the fact that the person was deprived, deprived uh, of the liberty and put in such conditions uh, consists the fact of the violation of the rights uh, under Article 3 of European Convention. Uh, the second uh, question and very important uh, one is about their responsibility. Who is responsible for this, let's say, gray zone of the right? Uh, thanks, it's 23. Uh, please, 20, 21, 22, uh, upper. Uh, well, we may, no, 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 upper, upper, upper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, exactly, yes. And here we see on this, uh, well, figure five, figure four, and figure three. Uh, well, here we see uh, the uh, number of the released persons. Yes, thanks. Uh, and uh, it just uh, some indicator of the uh, uh, potential victims uh, who suffered from this uh, military conflict. And uh, uh, in our organization, the Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union, we have several cases that were lodged to the European Court of Human Rights uh, with the uh, mentioning of the violation of the Article 5, Article 3 uh, of the Convention and uh, especially related to this category of, of the persons that were detained, uh, illegally detained and tortured or uh, um, suffered from in, inhuman treatment in these uh, conditions uh, uh, and later were released uh, uh, without proper uh, investigation of the case. And uh, now the cases are in the European Court of Human Rights and evaded on the general uh, uh, solution in the intergovernmental uh, case uh, Ukraine against Russia because let's say it's uh, uh, suspended uh, and uh, up to this solution uh, and uh, we still await as well uh, uh, with our uh, victims uh, and clients, we call them clients, uh, uh, on this uh, decision. Uh, so uh, in, the, in, the, in the meantime, the uh, um, uh, general, uh, not general, the prepared information was uh, also sent uh, uh, at the matter of evidence to the International Court, uh, uh, International Criminal Court, to the ICC, uh, with uh, substantial information and uh, improvement on the uh, uh, tortured, and the gender-based violence, and the uh, concrete uh, uh, um, evidences uh, of the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, non-proper uh, uh, holding facilities or the uh, um, uh, even uh, the concrete uh, examples of, of inhuman treatment of the tortures uh, and uh, other uh, cruel attitude towards persons detained. Uh, the, the single fact of the uh, deprivation of the liberty, it's Article 5 under the European Convention of Human Rights, uh, was considered uh, the uh, violation as well. The uh, time of the deprivation of liberty was uh, very, very different from several uh, hours uh, uh, till uh, days and months in detention places and we consider all these detention places as illegal one because they were not uh, appropriate to the or they they were not established by the officials uh, because even the officials uh, were not recognized and for today uh, it's uh, considered like uh, the uh, dark zone of the uh, law and uh, we may not even uh, um, organize any uh, monitoring mission to these uh, territories with the uh, uh, consideration of the conditions uh, uh, and uh, um, any, uh, let's say, official European uh, institution like uh, 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 human rights commissioner, like uh, uh, CPT committee, like other international instruments may not visit this territory, may not consider the conditions and uh, uh, improve even uh, some uh, situation. Well, uh, we have uh, uh, just briefly, we have second part of the uh, topic, uh, the persons that were sentenced before uh, the aggression of the Russian Federation uh, uh, into Crimea and in Donbass. And the number of the persons that were on this territory, uh, we uh, have uh, established later, three years even later after the aggression. And uh, uh, in Crimea, it was, uh, uh, 3,295 uh, persons, almost 300, uh, uh, 3,300. In uh, Donetsk, Lugansk, it was about 60,000 persons. And uh, the uh, big concern and big problem was with the uh, uh, transferring uh, this person to the uh, Ukrainian uh, territory, to the control by Ukrainian government territory. Till now, we have about 300 persons that were uh, transferred to the Ukrainian territory. And it's a huge problem uh, because this process is not uh, clear, is not uh, predictable. And uh, mm, on the Ukrainian side, we have about 1,000 uh, requests for such uh, transfer from this territory. And uh, mm, for example, I visited uh, the persons who were transferred, especially I'm interested, I'm, I'm visiting the penitentiary institutions, the colonies, and uh, one uh, specific uh, um, uh, category of the sentence persons is life sentence persons. And uh, some of them were transferred from the occupied territories in Donetsk region, especially from Donetsk, where the most uh, um, uh, person that were um, uh, transferred into 2016, 2018. Uh, only 12 person were transferred from Crimea. Of, it was just one uh, single uh, day when uh, former ombudsperson, uh, Mrs. Lutkovskaya, with Russian ombudsperson, uh, uh, they uh, used to uh, uh, obtain the agreement uh, uh, and to uh, sent uh, these 12 persons from uh, Crimea Peninsula to uh, Ukrainian uh, territory controlled by Ukrainian government. And um, uh, the biggest problem is under the rights of this person who were sentenced by Ukraine, but have to uh, serve the uh, uh, 
sentence in non-controlled territories uh, with uh, not better conditions, sometimes with danger for their health and their rights. And uh, we know even about the crucial case in 2015 when the colony number uh, 23 in Chernukino was uh, bombed because uh, um, it's uh, well. It's a uh, uh, very thin, uh, separate story, uh, and two persons were killed in this colony uh, under the bombs. Uh, uh, sentence persons, apropos, because they they may not uh, uh, find the place in the shelter and in the basement, and so on and so on. And um, uh, it was uh, just one example uh, that uh, the uh, Ukraine lost the control under the situation and under this territory and the persons uh, were not uh, the un, uh, not under Ukrainian jurisdiction and uh, they uh, became in this uh, dark or gray dark zone of the law and uh, we have also the category of such a person as the applicant to the European Court of Human Rights. It's very difficult to uh, contact with them because some of them are still on non-controlled territories and uh, they are dependent from the when they are in the penitentiary institution from the prison administrations uh, from even the inmates because you know these uh, criminal rules inside of these uh, um, uh, penitentiary institutions but still they have uh, uh, the uh, wish and uh, possibility to send the materials uh, and the consent from their side to represent their interest and uh, we used uh, the will uh, for uh, send the application to the European Court of Human Rights with the uh, complaint on the article uh, three, five, six, eight of the European Convention of Human Rights, sometimes even article number 10 and the uh, first article of the first protocol. Uh, so it's a large number of violations that are uh, with this vulnerable group of uh, prison population uh, or sentenced uh, by Ukraine population and uh, uh, as Victoria uh, colleagues of mine mentioned, uh, we work with this category of uh, um, uh, clients and we try to reestablish their rights and uh, three cases that were uh, uh, with the decision of the European court, I just repeat, it's the uh, Cesar uh, against Ukraine, Klebik against Ukraine, and Kurochenko and Zolotukhin against Ukraine uh, were prepared uh, by the lawyers of uh, our organizations and uh, organizations, sorry, and we continue the uh, uh, support in similar cases uh, uh, in uh, the uh, European court and other international jurisdictions like ICC. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Alexander, for this very interesting presentation. And uh, I see very uh, lots of uh, similarities uh, with, with Georgian uh, cases pending before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and um, uh, this is I, uh, one more time I, I need to emphasize that this is very important to cooperate with each other. I mean, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, and other. Uh, countries and lawyers uh, 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 to unify against the uh, same threats coming to our countries and to our, to our uh, to to the citizens of our countries. So it's re really important to have really skilled, uh, experienced lawyers uh, who will be representing individuals' interest in, the, in, in interest before the international tribunals. And then uh, now actually uh, I'll, I will be presenting my presentation uh, about the individual cases pending before the European Court of Human Rights uh, from Georgia and from this perspective. 
and, and uh, this is uh, actually one more opportunity to give you this brief information about the cases uh, I started uh, uh, many, many years ago. So uh, it was a um, 2008, actually, uh, we all know that uh, what happened to, to in, in Georgia and then Russia uh, started uh, innovation of, uh, of Georgia. Uh, and then finally, we have a, a decision interstate on interstate case. Uh, which is really, really important. But at the same time, there are individuals uh, and individuals applications. And, and uh, we need to uh, give more information to, to the uh, citizens of Georgia that uh, individual application is uh, quite an important tool for them to apply to the court. Uh, uh, during the interstate application, uh, there are less uh, uh, opportunity to present your case. And then my colleague, uh, Tina Golitiani, already mentioned that uh, during uh, uh, individual applications, uh, there is a more, more opportunity uh, to present your case. Uh, I have a kind of uh, uh, comparison uh, to the uh, uh, judgments already we have uh, delivered by the court uh, connected with the first interstate, uh, uh, my uh, dear colleague Besarion Bohashuli was presenting uh, this interstate case. So it's it's really important to take into consideration that uh, uh, Russia already uh, exercised uh, individual applications uh, decided upon this issue. So the judgments uh, uh, delivered by the court on on a deportation issue. Uh, already uh, executed by them. I mean, individual measures, but uh, general measures, uh, you know, that uh, it needs uh, the huge reforms for, for Russian Federation. It's not easy to, to make it in, in, in several years even. So uh, on the, to make comparison with the, with the second interstate application uh, and, and judgment already delivered, uh, we still actually have uh, this opportunity to compare with the first uh, judgment and uh, uh, to continue uh, forcing uh, respondent states uh, to make them responsible for the concrete issues, which is not clearly mentioned in the interstate, interstate application. Uh, what I mean, uh, it, it, it's about, uh, uh, you may guess about this, uh, uh, host, uh, started, uh, starting uh, uh, of uh, factual and actual uh, hostilities, I mean, from 8th of August to 12th of August. So it's uh, really important to uh, um, uh, make uh, a more stronger uh, um, uh, uh, proofs that uh, individuals have already presented before the court, but at the same time during the communication, uh, there is no communication started on individual cases yet, but uh, there is an opportunity to uh, to be prepared for this uh, uh, step of the uh, case litigation. So we need to be prepared then and, and uh, to uh, collect uh, evidence this, uh, that uh, individual experience uh, during this uh, active hostilities. Uh, there are several directions we need to know. Uh, this is about the killing, uh, but killing was uh, happening uh, through bombing and, and through active uh, uh, hostilities. When, when, uh, uh, when uh, uh, South Ossetian militias and then uh, Russian paramilitary uh, personnel was actively uh, innovating uh, Georgian territory. So it's uh, important to separate with uh, these two uh, quite uh, different directions because uh, first it was happening bombing uh, Georgian territory and then actually uh, Russian personnel were, and, and together with uh, South Ossetian militia um, was occupying the concrete villages. And uh, that's, uh, this is what uh, uh, is mentioned uh, in the judgment, uh, interstate judgment, I mean, 
uh, that uh, bombardment uh, it's not effective control of the territory but uh, when uh, there is a strong proof that uh, killing was occurred by the uh, South Ossetian military or, or uh, Russian military officers. So it's, it's clear that uh, in uh, ISA case and other uh, cases decided by the court, it's clear evidence um, have to be uh, presented before the court that uh, 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 this is enough to make statement by the court that Article 2 is violated by the, by the respondent state. So again, mm -hmm. um, there are uh, difficulties for individual applications pending before the court, but at the same time, this is an opportunity for us uh, to be more prepared uh, for those cases pending before the court. And that's why we need uh, cooperation with each other because uh, next case, uh, Recrimia is uh, pending before the court. And then uh, uh, before this judgment uh, against uh, Russia from Georgia uh, uh, on merits decided, which is actually uh, first judgment uh, on merits uh, during the last 20 years. Uh, so it's, it's quite a long time uh, first uh, when actually uh, court made, a, um, uh, made, made this judgment. But several weeks earlier of this judgment delivered, uh, we had the admissibility decision of the uh, European, European Court of Human Rights about the Crimea case. Uh, the problem I see in this judgment is that uh, Article 14 is not uh, mentioned in this judgment. And then uh, it's, it's uh, to differentiate this. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, during the first case, uh, the Georgian government presented and uh, argued that Article 14 is, was violated by the court. Uh, anyway, actually, it was not considered by the court enough evidence is presented uh, before the uh, uh, before them, uh, because uh, uh, court decided that uh, uh, Article 14 was, was not violated. During the individual uh, cases, also, uh, I was arguing that uh, Article 14 was violated, but uh, court considered uh, that uh, it was a, there, there wasn't a necessity to examine this article to taken together with other uh, articles presented uh, for, for violation. Uh, but uh, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, mm, uh, to compare with the uh, uh, second judgment, uh, we see that uh, uh, Georgian government have not even claimed this uh, article to be, uh, to make responsible uh, respondent states. Uh, for the violation of, of uh, discriminatory attitude towards um, uh, Georgians. But uh, uh, in individual applications, uh, uh, we have presented uh, Article 14, uh, which is, uh, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, about the discriminatory attitude to uh, Georgian, ethnic Georgians. Uh, um, the reason for that uh, uh, we are given because of the total uh, destruction of religious, Georgian religious. And then uh, uh, we actually partially know about this case. Well, and then uh, uh, in, in on occupied territories, there was uh, religious, uh, uh, part of the religious was settled by the ethnic obsession, but part of the villages were uh, settled by the Georgian. And exactly, uh, concretely, uh, just only Georgian villages were uh, uh, occupied and then uh, uh, looted all the property existed on this uh, territory, on this, in these villages. So uh, the problem actually, there are, uh, um, uh, uh, in individual cases, uh, for example, uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, 
registration documentation for this property to claim before the court. And, and when a lawyer is claiming for this uh, violation of property rights, uh, we are presenting before the court uh, just uh, uh, all possible uh, 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 documentation which exists uh, at the moment. And, and it's not the registration documentation, but it's it's kind of uh, uh, it's kind of, uh, for example, uh, your your neighbors uh, who are actually supporting this uh, evidence, and then th this kind of uh, you know not not really proper uh, evidences to be uh, to make really strong argumentation before the court. So a lot of uh, other problems uh, rising during the litigation of these kinds of cases. Um, uh, that's why we need uh, kind of uh, cooperation, sharing information, I mean, uh, with Ukrainian colleagues and, and Moldovan colleagues, because uh, Ion Manoli, for example, from Moldova, they already um, Finish the litigation of these kind of cases connected property rights and uh, and, and uh, our colleagues from, from uh, Sergei uh, is litigating cases uh, connected with the uh, rights of uh, uh, movement for, for citizens of, uh, of Ukraine. So it's uh, um, it's a, a good opportunity. Even in, even for for the future, because if we uh, start litigation of these kind of cases, so for the future uh, there will be there will be uh, more opportunity to um, to be more or less protected uh, uh, from, from this kind of uh, violation uh, in the future. Uh, anyway, uh, for for countries like Georgia, like uh, Ukraine and Moldova. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think that uh, there, is a, um, there are other avenues, of course, but uh, this is a more, more appropriate way uh, uh, to protect our rights uh, because, uh, by using this international tribunal. Uh, and uh, uh, focusing on the uh, individual rights, uh, there are also uh, article, Eight, which is uh, included in the individual applications, uh, which is not mentioned uh, in the inter interstate application, and uh, uh, and, uh, and this is crucially important for individuals so who lost the not only property but also uh, have no uh, ability to be returned to the uh, houses because houses are totally destroyed. And then even villages, uh, instead of uh, those houses, uh, at the moment there is a uh, military base is built by the Russian Federation. So uh, I'm totally out of time, and then this is not, uh, uh, never, uh, the time will never be enough to present you this uh, cases because, because there are lots of uh, uh, kind of, uh, 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 different directions which which have to be discussed during this conference but um, because of the pandemic we do, we don't have this opportunity unfortunately but uh, I really hope that uh, in the future we will have uh, uh, other avenues of cooperation and now again I, I would like to ask uh, our Georgian colleagues especially to ask questions to, to our Ukrainian experts. Uh, if this is one more time, uh, you are uh, you have uh, you are unable to to, to do this. And uh, again, Inga, uh, is there? Any uh, so, we have, uh, so we have questions to Alexander. Uh, yeah, I I brought the uh, question uh, two questions to to me uh, just briefly for one minute. Uh -huh. What can the Ukrainian government uh, to do to prevent illegal detention places. Uh, A, accountability and investigation. Uh, and plus uh, the uh, second question, uh, what 
uh, Ukrainian government uh, may do. Uh, the leverage does uh, the Ukrainian government have through legal or political channels to address these illegal detentions? Well, just one example. Um, this report, I prepared this report in 2015. And uh, in 2016, we received the uh, request from the UN. Uh, they uh, tried to uh, uh, distribute this report as official paper uh, during the session. Uh, and uh, they asked us for permission to consider uh, and to, to, to uh, uh, give them, uh, uh, let's say, copyrights to distribution because they considered it uh, as official uh, document Document and uh, uh, it's kind of uh, credential uh, credentials that were uh, uh, that were expressed. So we try to pre um, to prepare the materials that might be used uh, uh, in international uh, arena as the advocacy documents, and in the same times, it's the proofs that might be uh, used in the criminal uh, investigations uh, uh, by Ukrainian uh, national institutions. But uh, as you may check uh, with the text, uh, uh, well, it's the lack of confidence from the victims that is uh, they will uh, they are not interested to uh, uh, go through this uh, legal procedure, spend time, and uh, again uh, have this uh, uh, let's say uh, the effect of. Uh, uh, revive uh, the same sentiments uh, that in detentions, and they will not uh, uh, address the officials uh, in controlled uh, uh, territories of Ukraine. And we have only dozen uh, of cases uh, uh, among these thousands of uh, victims so this is a huge problem and we have to uh, and it's the task of our organization we have the uh, database and we have the documentation center that collect the evidences uh, and the information on such crimes thanks thanks very much alexander uh, and next uh question to uh, Tina Golikiani. Uh, can you Tina, hear me? Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, so thank you for the question, actually. The question is very um, interesting. In the, in the interstate complaint brought, uh, in, in interstate case uh, judgment, um, Russia versus uh, Ukraine, re Crimea, in the decision, um, actually the court found the jurisdiction uh, of Russia um, and um, whether uh, while in, in, in Georgian case no so what, what what is the actually approach and how this could be um, this could be analyzed now um, well um, I think um, the one thing is that uh, I would like to uh, underline and start from from this is that approach to the court, approach of the court to the issue of jurisdiction is the same in both cases. Also, in um, uh, the Crimea case, the court looked into effective control of the territory and state agent authority for the purpose of um, control of our individuals. Now, um, um, the, why the issue, um, why the court reached different conclusion in Crimea case um, is, uh, from my perspective, quite simple because the factual circumstances were quite difficult. Uh, quite different. In Georgia versus Russia, we had, especially in relation to this active phase of hostilities, not, let's not forget that the, the, the problematic aspect, the aspect that is so ma many times challenged and discussed, is actually only this one part, which is the, um, the active phase of hostilities, is the period of, in, in simple terms, war, right? Even though the war be was before that in continued after, however, this active phase. Now, um, there, um, the court, once again, going back to Georgian case, said that it, it is a context of chaos, nobody controls um, anything, um, and uh, that is why there is no effective control, and neither the state agent authority control. Whether we agreed or we agree with this assessment or not, that's a different question, um, but this was the assessment of the court. Now, what we had in the um, Ukraine versus Russia, re Crimea case, actually 
um, the jurisdiction of Russia was found uh, based on the effective control that it exercised over the Crimea. Um, and when coming to that conclusion, the court um, took into account the, um, the, the, the particular size and the strength of the increased Russian military presence in Crimea. And this is something that it's also not the specifically made um, for the for this case, this is approach that actually the court has developed in a um, number of its case law, including the, the for instance, the Loisido case, um, etc. So the effective control could be established first by um, the amount of military troops on the territory and uh, the economic, military, um, political support that this country may gives to the um, local administration. Um, this was actually the same conclusion was reached by the court in Georgia versus Russia case in the second part of the case, in the post, um, uh, um, post a, a August 12 events. The, pro the, the, the question mark is only in relation to the active phase of hostilities and in, in active phase of hostilities, these tests developed by the court and applied throughout its case law well, is simply not, um, not applicable because as the court noted, nobody controlled the territory, notwithstanding how many troops were there because it was the period of um, active hostilities. And that is why um, we have these kind of uh, different uh, conclusions reached um, um, by the court in both cases. However, from my um, uh, understanding, uh, the approach and the tests used in both cases are, are, are pretty much the same. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tina. And the uh, ne next question is to me about uh, uh, about uh, just satisfaction issue and what consequences uh, we could expect uh, uh, in the future. So um, uh, coming uh, from the experience, uh, coming from the experience of the previous case, actually, uh, we can assume that uh, on individual case, uh, uh, cases pending before the European Court of Human Rights, we have more opportunity uh, to have execution uh, of the judgment on uh, uh, on individual measures, I mean, uh, because uh, when uh, uh, we had a uh, actually decision uh, judgment on on deportation issue uh, previously decided in in 2016 uh, in 20th of December uh, on Shioshuli case, actually uh, there was. Um, uh, procedure before the court, of course, and then and then uh, uh, before the committee of ministers, and uh, we presented all necessary documentation before the committee of ministers, and then Russia, to my surprise, exercised uh, this decision. So, uh, concrete sum of money was transferred to the account of the applicant, and but but it was uh, the only case. Who, uh, not only actually, I'm sorry, there was a. Two, just two cases executed in, in 2016, uh, 17, sorry. And, and then actually uh, on just that section issue, there was a second decision of the court in 2019. And then uh, uh, exceeding three months uh, period, which is given to the, each of the, uh, which is given to the respondent state to execute uh, the judgment. Uh, Russia actually managed to uh, make some, you know, points that uh, there was a not uh, necessary information presented before the court. So we uh, were obliged to uh, give them uh, specific information uh, by the specific form, which is uh, actually, uh, well, you know, Russia gave us a concrete uh, 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 form, or we, which was filled by, by uh, the applicants. And then uh, 
be presented before the uh, committee of ministers and then and to the uh, respondent state, state directly so then afterwards uh, decisions was exercised and all individuals uh, uh, applications uh, actually uh, during uh, several months uh, they have this compensation on their accounts uh, bank accounts so uh, uh, from this experience we can assume that after uh, uh, there will be cases already decided by the court on individual uh, cases pending before the court. So uh, I expect that uh, even uh, on these individual cases, there will be a, a execution uh, like it happened uh, during the previous uh, cases. So uh, I see that uh, that's why actually individual cases uh, uh, are more uh more um, kind of uh, uh done by the by the applicants by concrete individuals and and uh, this is fitted for them for their needs uh, but in, on interstate applications on on the first case actually it is not not executed uh, till now it is pending before the committee of ministers there are the debates on on different aspects but but uh, what will happen on an interstate uh, 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 judgment, uh, I mean, this war case, uh, th there is a one year um, to negotiate with each other for, for the sites, I mean, Georgia and, and Russia, and then actually uh, um, there will be several years uh, for, for this, for, for execution of this judgment. Uh, I'm not very optimistic, but, but finally, I, I really hope that and then I believe that Russia will execute these judgments on, on the first case and on the, for, on the second case as well. Uh, I, I hope that I, I made this uh, answer for the and uh, there is a uh, uh, but but there is a question but but for whom uh, uh, could anybody from, from panelists uh, would like to answer this question, which we have on uh, in chat? Uh, could you be able to look into our chat and then see this question? This is uh, Ukrainian and um, Moldovan lawyers. Mm. Uh, you are welcome, Marco. You are welcome. And then, uh, for uh, I'd like to uh, draw attention of our panelists. I mean, uh, Ukrainian and Moldovan lawyers to look uh, the question we have in chat. And then, actually, uh, this is about the uh, about the in influence uh, of this judgment. I mean, Georgia versus Russia judgment. Uh, where it is uh, active pace of hostilities and, and occupation price, price uh, in the present case. Uh, do you think that will be uh, replaced in, in uh, relation yeah. to the individual cases? So, uh, I mean, uh, kind of... Um, uh, how how uh, this uh, judgment uh, Georgia versus Russia will, will influence uh, on the on the other cases actually, uh, which will be decided in the future. Well, what do you think about? It? If I may, uh, just just briefly. Well, uh, thanks for this question. I think that uh, uh, we we are in the uh, same ship, and uh, well. Uh, it's strange that we have three uh, interstate uh, cases, uh, Moldova against, let's say, uh, 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 it's not Moldova against Russia, but the cases against Moldova and Russia. That Russia is responsible for the uh, uh, violations of human rights in Transnistria. Uh, Georgia against uh, uh, Russia, Ukraine against Russia. So something wrong 
with Russia. And uh, I, I think that uh, the uh, this uh, um, speech formula, uh, active uh, phase of hostility and occupation phase in the present case uh, is uh, probably, uh, let's say, the influence of the uh, um, uh, pro uh, procedural uh, steps uh, in the court and the kind of, uh, uh, as, as you are aware, uh, uh, agreement uh, uh, for final solution and uh, uh, how it might be uh, the uh, matter of influence for Ukrainian uh, uh, cases. Uh, it's also the uh, big and good question. I see that we are most uh, uh, related now uh, on the uh, in, uh, uh, intergovernmental cases, interstate cases, uh, uh, Ukraine against Russia. So when we will have concrete uh, decision in this case, then we will see what is important less on or more uh, in other uh, interstate cases uh, 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 to Ukrainian uh, matters. And uh, uh, I see that uh, you have uh, worked very deeply with all legal issues in, in this uh, um, uh, interstate case uh, uh, Georgia against Russia too, and uh, uh, go ahead uh, for the uh, fulfillment and full execution in all uh, the elements of this case, case and uh, to continue the work. And I, I think that uh, our cooperation might be also uh, fruitful and useful for both sides, for Georgian and Ukrainian. And I see we have the same, uh, let's say, uh, um, not very good uh, neighbor that uh, should uh, be uh, responsible for the uh, situation uh, uh, as it might be seen, but the uh, really it's the war with its consequences. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much, Alexander, for your for your answer. Uh, is, is there anyone who who want to? May, may it. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, yes, <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, there is no uh, direct connection between interstate cases and indiv individual cases if uh, uh, we, uh, as far as we uh, talk about interstate cases, we have uh, uh, claim of one uh, state uh, against another state. So it's a direct line. And if, uh, let's say, Georgia, or it's possible that Ukraine in the interstate case that regards Donbass is not able to uh, provide evidence that Russia controlled the territory, it's, there is no basis for the uh, court to uh, uh, get such uh, conclusion and to uh, say that Russia is responsible. But uh, I mean this uh, valid just in the frames of interstate case. When we talk uh, about individual cases in Ukraine, usually we have such cases uh, against uh, both states, Ukraine and Russian Federation. And uh, I believe that it's more difficult uh, question for the court because um, now uh, I would say that we uh, just, uh can it's it, 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 it it's uh our uh, uh idea i mean uh idea of uh, lawyers but not what uh, uh the court actually uh, said that there is a vacuum uh 
uh, as I believe the court said that uh, Russia is not responsible and uh, full stop. Because there is no evidence that, that Russia control is difficult to say. But if we have uh, individual cases against two states, uh, I believe that uh, the court cannot uh, avoid uh, this situation, and the court uh, will be uh, forced to uh, find uh, which state is responsible and uh, if it's uh, impossible to uh, separate responsibility of two states, uh, I think that court uh, can say that both states are responsible. I mean that there is no uh, uh, such uh, direct uh, dependence between uh, individual cases and interstate cases in the situation if individual uh, uh, case submitted against two states as we have is Ukraine. I don't know how uh, it, it is in uh, Georgian individual cases. So it's, it's difficult to say, but in Crimea, I would say that we have mostly the same situation because uh, the conclusion of the court is that uh, uh, Russian Federation uh, controls uh, the uh, Crimean Peninsula at least since 27th of uh, February. So we have the period before, but it not uh, uh, contested by uh, any uh, state. It's enough that uh, court uh, uh, believe or c c c court, uh, the court is persuaded that uh, Russia controls uh, since 27th of December, and uh, it, it, it's enough for all uh, the claims included into this case. But uh, the question about the period uh, before the 27th of uh, February 2014 is uh, the same, but it is hiding in, in, in the uh, Crimean case, I mean. And one more a little point, just for your information. Uh, I hear my uh, colleagues, and uh, I, I mean from Georgia and from Moldova, and I see that Russia is constant. You should know that, uh, for example, we have uh, in, in Ukraine, we have uh, about uh, more than 10,000 uh, cases pending before the European Court of Human Rights. And more than half of this uh, number uh, submitted by, uh, initiated and submitted by Russian authorities, about 6,000 uh, cases. We have, uh, as I know, you, you had uh, uh, the same situation uh, regarding uh, uh, Abkhazia and Ossetia. Uh, and Russia tried to uh, submit cases on behalf of uh, persons uh, from uh, these territories occupied by the Russian Federation. And we have the same situation in Ukraine. We have a strong investigation uh, made by uh, Ukrainian journalists from uh, Radio uh, Free Europe, uh, Radio Liberty. Uh, and and uh, there is a lot of uh, evidence that Russia uh, provide the same the same policy against uh, all our countries and it's it, it's a little bit beyond of uh, the main topic but uh, i think it, this is important thank you uh thank you so much sergey yes uh, uh, there are there were actually and uh, the, there still uh, exist uh, individual applications coming from the occupied territories i mean ossetian supply to the uh, European Court of Human Rights, but the uh, most majority of these cases uh, was considered inadmissible by the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, so, so I, I'm I'm not really uh, expecting that, that something different will will happen in in your uh, case as well. So this is uh, I guess this is the next uh, topic to discuss with you, my dear colleagues. It it was a really great opportunity uh, to have. Uh, 
this conference uh, and, and this discussion with you, I, I'm I'm deeply sure that uh, we we need uh, some more cooperation, more opportunity to discuss different uh, issues in detail. And then uh, after pandemic, we will have this opportunity. And then uh, uh, I'm afraid we we are totally out of time. Uh, um, my my uh, uh, my colleagues already. Uh, yeah, uh, letting me know that, that we need to finish because it, it's it's we we don't have even even uh, <laughs> even more time uh, to continue our discussion. So once again, my dear colleagues, thank you so much for this participation, for this very active participation, uh, especially from my. Uh, კი აუცილებლად აუცილებლად იქნება ეს შესაძლებლობა ა i have comments from from colleagues ის ხააგის და სტრასბურგის ანუ რა რამდენად ეფექტურია ხააგის და სტრასბურგის თანხედრა მაგალითად ახლა ჩვენ საქართველოს მაგალითზე ვიცით ქაბატონი ბენსუ და ჩართულობა საქართველოს კონფლიქტთან დაკავშირებით და ანუ უკრაინაში თუ არის მსგავსი პრეცედენტი ხააგასთან მიმართებაში და და მაგალითად კოლეგების აზრით რომელი უფრო ეფექტური იქნებოდა ჰააგის ჩატრებული ღონისძიებები ესე რომ თქვა თუ სტრასბურგის გადაწყვეტილება რა ვიფიქროთ ეს საუმაულოდ კარგი თემა იქნება ამას თუ ამას თუ განვიხილოთ thank you so much to my colleagues again Yes, we will have uh, in, uh, opportunity to discuss this kind of uh, different kind of issues in the future. Thank you again, my dear colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rivan. Ukrmasi madloba kide vertel expert eps Moldova kide Ukraine dan sakartol dan zaliak bulim tukdebaro. მიუხედავად ორ საათიანი კონფერენციისა სამი საათი გაგრძელდა უღრმესი მადლობა ჰარჯიმანს ანა თქვენ უდიდესი მადლობა ანამეტრეველს ასეთი გულისხმიერებისთვის და ასეთი თანმიმდევრული კარგი თარგმანისთვის და ყველა დამსწრეს ძალიან დიდი მადლობა თემის დაინტერესებისთვის და ერთი რაც მინდა ბოლოს თქვა თემა ძალიან საინტერესოა და რა თქმა უნდა უნდა გავერთიანდეთ და უნდა ვიბრძოლოთ ერთად აი ქსელის მეშვეობით ყოფა რა ყველაზე უფრო მნიშვნელოვანია ჩემო მეგობრებო და ამაზე ვიფიქროთ ზუსტად იმ უფლებადამცველების იმ ადოკატების მხარდამჭერა როდესაც მათ წინააღმდეგ სხვადასხვა მექანიზმები წარიმართება რომ მათ აღარ განახორციელონ ასეთი უფლებადაცვითი საქმიანობები და შეუზღუდო სხვადასხვა მექანიზმები აი აქ უფრო მყისიერი გაერთიანება გვჭირდება მყისიერი რეაგირება გვჭირდება რათა მე ვიცი რომ უფლება დამცველი და ადვოკატი არასდროს ხელს არ ჩაიქნებს მაგრამ ყველაფერს აქ რაღაც საზღვარი ხო და აი ფიქრო ამ მექანიზმებზე ღირს დალაპარაკება და ხელში კიდე მშიელობა და უფრო ეფექტური ღონისძიებების დაგეგმა მადლობა კიდევ ერთხელ ყველა ძალიან საინტერესო მიგინებებისთვის და გულიმწყდება მარა ვფიქრო რომ ჩვენ ამ თემას გავაგძელებ და უფრო სიღრმეებში განვიხილავთ და გავიზიარებთ კიდე ამ შედეგებს ევრო სასამართლოსი და პატარა რემარკას ვიტყოდი მართალია აი ახლა მახსენდება თურქეთის მიერ კიპროსთან დაკავშირებული იქ მთელი 10-14 წელი დასჭირდა ინდივიდუალურ საჩივრებზე კომპენსაციის ანაზღაურებას ვამბობ ილუზია არ მაგრამ ხვალზეგეს ახსრულდება მაგრამ მე ნამდვილად მჯერა იმისი რომ სხვადასხვა მექანიზმებით უნივერსალური და რეგიონალური მექანიზმებით აპელირება აი თუნდაც საქართველოს და მიმართებაში ჟენევის ფორმატის მოლაპარაკება იქ რომ გავუჟღერდება რომ აი რუსეთმა აღებული ვალდებულებები არ შეასრულა ხო არა აქ ეს პრეცენტ სასა ევროპული სასამართლოს გადაწყვეტილების აღსრულებაზე ვისაუბრებთ თუ სხვა კიდე მექანიზმებში ხო გაეროს თუ ევრო სასამართლოს ეს თავის თავად ეს წვეთ წვეთ წალი მაინც თავის შედეგს დადებს და დღეს თუ არა 10 წლის მერე მაინც აღსრულდება და მაინც მიიღებს ის დაზარალებული ადამიანები ის ინდივიდუები თავის საზღაურს რაც ამ ომის შედეგად მიადგა ამ მოქალაქეებს სამწუხაროა ნამდვილად რომ ასე გვიან მაგრამ 
ماین تمارتی این دکمه قبلی با ممکنی روم آغدگی با دا ماتی اوکل ببی آرامت امورالورات آرامت ماتریالورات هت سان از غاو دب. آرگی یک نمرو سرت تو میار ارسه بود دست. آستی تودی مزبول بیار قادس. سعی کت سوسی رو لبید. مطلب این گشنه کنتریبوسی است. خواهد از دیدی مطلب این دو وقت خیل تا دروی بیت دارگم شد و بیت. دیدی مطلب آستی سعی انتظار کنترلیسی است. دیدی مطلب آستی. مطلب از گفته است. مطلب از گفته است. دیدی مطلب من از لیو بیت است. خواهد از دیدی مطلب. مطلب. Thank you very much and goodbye. Yeah.